I'm uh, delighted uh, to introduce uh, uh, one of the youngest uh, speakers of this conference, I suppose, uh, Davide Yengo. Uh, he is a student of uh, classical philology at the University of uh, Pisa and uh, at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa too. Uh, he graduated uh, cum laude uh, with a thesis about uh, Aristophanes. Uh, he got in touch with uh, uh, our mythical childhood award in uh, 2022 when uh, he took part uh, in uh, an Erasmus Plus, uh, Plus study and um, internship uh, program at the Faculty of Artes Liberales uh, of the University of uh, Warsaw. And um, his paper is uh, titled, uh, um, I understand the death, mute, and hear the words of the dumb, framing the depiction of disabilities in Herodotus histories. Uh, so we prepare to listen to him. Uh, and uh, please, uh, Davide, uh, take the floor and uh, thank you so much for your paper. Uh, I thank Professor Garulli for her introduction. I thank Dziękuję Pani Marcinia for the invitation. And thank you everyone for having me here today. I'm delighted to take part into this conference and to have the role of a speaker from Athens where uh, the, the author that I chose to talk about got his success, basically. Herodotus histories got published here in Athens. So it's quite delightful 25 centuries later to be able to talk about this uh, in front of all of you. Uh, let me just share the screen with my presentation, which I hope you won't mind too much. It's a, it's a bit boring, to be honest. Uh, it's just a wall of text, but uh, I, I will need it to um, develop my considerations about the theme that I chose to talk about. So I would like to start with um, the words of Lena Davis, who uh, treated uh, in his, um, book the disability studies reader it is a recollection of papers about different aspects of disability as it has been dealt with in the past and in different forms there is a chapter especially devoted to disability in uh, classical studies so how disability has been perceived in antiquity and how it has been received by us as uh, scholars and students of uh, ancient times modern uh, students of ancient times uh, i would like to read the uh, this quote, if I'm able to move, okay. I'm sorry for the complications here. Uh, so I would like to give a, de a broader definition of disability so that we can understand the ground, the common ground that we are reasoning on. We live in a world of norms. Each of us endeavors to be normal or else del deliberately tries to avoid that state. We consider what the average person does, thinks, earns or consumes. I didn't mean to move the slide. Uh, to understand the disabled body, one must return to the concept of the norm, the normal body. Recent work on the ancient Greeks, on pre-industrial Europe and on tribal peoples, for example, shows that disability was once regarded very differently from the way it is now. We shall see whether this is true about Herodotus or not. We will discuss it about it later, uh, if, you, if you're willing to. Um, the social process of disabling arrived with industrialization and with a set of practices and discourses that are linked to late 18th and 19th century notions of nationality, race, gender, criminality, sexual orientation, and so on. So basically what Davis is telling us is that disability as it was perceived in antiquity is quite different from what we perceive it as today because it is basically, it has become a social construct just as much as race, gender, nationality, and sexual orientation. Let's see what Herodotus has to say about this. I would like to start from the very first methodological claim that Herodotus presents to us in, his, in the beginning of his histories by saying that this is the display of the inquiry of Herodotus of Alicarnassus, so that things done by men not be forgotten in time, and that great and marvelous deeds, some displayed by the Hellenists, some by the barbarians, not lose their glory. What we can see here, why I called it a, uh, an inclusive method, an inclusive historiographical method, is the fact that Herodotus takes into account deeds or talks about. So the Greeks, the Persians, uh, the Ethiopes, every population that he deals with 
has accomplished great deeds. And what he focuses on is presenting those deeds as impartially as he possibly can without giving too much importance. Of course, it is important whether it was done by the Greeks or the barbarians, but they are all equally uh, worth of not disappearing into oblivion. So this sort of uh, broader notion of inclusivity, which inclusiveness, which uh, deals with things that are done by men, exanthropon, by the humans. But we shall see. Let's move on to corporate disability. And why did I call this the perception of extraordinary? Because somehow, especially in Herodotus' perception, uh, disability is something extraordinary, not as much in the fact that some people are born with some, mm, like some, some would call it minorities. Uh, disability studies tend to reject this kind of terms because it, of course, it, it, it tends to be uh, discriminant, discrimination and discriminative towards uh, those people who have disabilities. But mm, the fact is we have to project ourselves in the ancient minds. And generally, as we shall see, disability was perceived as either a consequence or a cause for bad actions and bad situations. So you were disabled because you had done something wrong or because you will be provoking something wrong, you will be causing something wrong to happen. Um, but what I try to focus uh, on in this slide is the story of Croesus, who is the king of Lydians, so uh, an Afro-Asiatic population. Um, who Croesus is trying to search for confirmation by oracles of whether he should or not attack another empire, the future great Median empire. And he is testing out oracles so that he can know whether the responses that he gets from the oracles are trustworthy or not. So he makes up a completely absurd ritual, which consists in boiling in a bronze pot both uh, uh, tortoise and lamb meat together. and he wants the oracle to guess what he's doing. And he defines it as a mechanon exeurainte So something which no conjecture could discover and carried it out on the appointed day. So something that's, it, it, that is so absurd and out of the regular norm that no one but a god could guess it. And the answer that he gets from the oracle uh, of Delphi, so the Pythia, is quite astonishing because the Pythia does not respond ag aggressively, does not um, just attack the um, the messengers that went to or the oracle's response but she kind of humiliates Croesus for even doubting the power of the god and the pythia states i know the number of the grains of sand so it is already something absurdly uh, extreme for a human to know so if there is a godly intervention i know the extent of the sea the sea was an infinite amount of water surrounding uh, the emerged lands, according to the Greek uh, geography, basically, for an um, old classical uh, period. So it is already astonishing, but the most absurd thing that the oracle is able to do is understand the mute and hear the voiceless. We have seen before when, when Professor... Um, Professor DC had problems with the audio that she had to signal it to us by moving her hands. As, it, as an Italian, I know how much hands can talk, but we were we were having troubles understanding her because we did not hear her. And this is the problem with also with the Greek conception of uh, impaired hearing and communication, oral communication. If you cannot speak, you cannot be understood. If you cannot be understood, you cannot rule and you cannot have meaning in a society. This is the basics, the basic assumption of what not having words, not having the ability to express your thoughts meant in ancient times. So the fact that a god, and rather a mortal as the Pythia, that is a representative of the god on earth, can understand the mute and hear the voiceless is the most striking assertion of power that a mortal can present to someone that, that they're speaking to. So I think this, this gives us the dimension of how great it was for the ancient, ancient Greeks to have someone dealing with uh, a disability. So the point is not the extraordinary character of disability itself, because mythology and history of ancient times is full of characters that developed some sort of either physical or mental illness or disability. 
The point is how others deal with the, this disability, and only the gods can deal effectively with such a situation, as we can see here. First book is when it comes to Chrysus's younger son. Uh, Chrysus has two sons, Atis, that will die because uh, Chrysus had received an oracle that stated that the, the Atis, so his son, would die young, and he tries to avoid it. So Chrysus is stubbornly trying to fight fate and the gods, and he perishes exactly because of this. So Atis doesn't make it through, that doesn't survive, especially because his father is trying to uh, defy the gods, but he, of course he cannot. He has a second son, we don't know the name, which uh, I have already mentioned, it rather just says, uh, and he is defined as fine in the other respects, but mute. So the fact that he is considered okay for everything else, the, the Greek word for fine is apiakes, so regular, normal, not nothing exceptional. The only thing that was not okay with him, Herodotus tell, tells us, is the fact that he wouldn't speak. And the Pythian priestess answered him uh, thus. To, so Croesus asked whether his son would ever speak, because it was sort of a shame for a sovereign to have a mute son. And the Pythia tells him, Lydian, king of many, greatly foolish. We will stop on this adjective, meganetie. Uh, we will Soon, soon see what does it mean. Croesus, wish not to hear in the palace the voice often prayed for of your son speaking. It were better for you that he remain mute as before, for an unlucky day, for on an unlucky day shall he first speak. So not only is it disgraceful in Croesus' perspective to have a mute, to have a mute so son, but for the god, it will be even worse when the, the, the son will speak, will gain the word. And we shall see why. This is the ending of the story. Croesus is attacked, and one enemy attacks him and is about to kill him. He doesn't care about dying anymore. He just wants it to end because he know he know he knows it'll be a disgrace for his own person and his reign. And his mute son, when he saw the Persian, so he was fighting against the Persians, coming on, in fear and distress, broke into speech and cried, Man, do not kill Croesus. So the only time the, that Croesus son gains the ability to speak is after going through a trauma. He is about to see his father slaughtered by an enemy, and only then he gains the ability to speak. And what is curious, and we will see it when, in another in another example with roles reversed, uh, roles reversed, is uh, that this was the first time that he spoke, and after that, for all the rest of his life, he had the power of speech. So he gains this power after a trauma, after undergoing a trauma, and he keeps this for his entire life. He, he loses the character, characteristic of being mute. So, and this is something, uh, the, the fact that a trauma causes long lasting effects. We will also see it in the case of Epizelos in the sixth book in a while. Now I wanted to focus a bit on the word nepios. We saw the mega nepie kroitos. So, the king is very mm, senseless. He is foolish, much foolish. The word nepios has been questioned. This etymology has been questioned by Chantrain, Pierre Chantrain, who uh, has been dealing his whole life with Greek etymologies. But we can find parallels for this word in other languages, such as Latin, in France, even Polish, niemowle. Uh, and both these words, just like a a possible interpretation for nepios, in spite of the fact that Chantrain's, uh, Chantrain rejects this, is the fact that someone does not speak in fans, non fari in Latin, do not speak, nie mowle, nie mówić in Polish, do not speak, ne epios, ne epein, so do not speak. Again, this has been questioned, but uh, we, we can see where the thing, where the general reasoning is going. If someone cannot speak, they are not able to articulate words, so they're not able of, they're not capable of complex thought, just like babies. Babies do not speak because they cannot express what they're thinking, because their line of reasoning is too simple to be expressed through words. And we can see how, in general, the um, semantic area for speaking and the semantic area for reasoning is pretty much coincidental in ancient Greek. So we have 
alogos, which means unreasonable, but also voiceless. So that cannot speak. So one cannot reason, but cannot speak. Uh, we have anoitos, which literally means not able to see, not able to reason, so not able to use their mind and not able to articulate words. We have the word nepios that we saw means literally child, so unable to utter words. It also means unhearing, deaf. So there is a strong intertwining between this, all of these semantic areas. So hearing, speaking, and reasoning are tightly connected. I also put here a cur curious um, parallel for modern Greek. Greek uses the word alogo, meaning reasonless, so senseless, but also wordless, to indicate the horse. So an animal that cannot speak and is stubborn is indicated through the word alogos. So an animal that cannot reason and cannot speak, of course, all animals are wordless because speaking is someone that is typically human, apart from parrots that mimic humans. But in general, animals are all aloga, aloga zoa, so the animals that cannot speak. But modern Greek only uses it for uh, the alogo, so the, the horse. Um, now we're moving to see what has been called the first recorded case of shell shock. Shell shock is a definition that um, came out in the last century, so in the 20th century, after the First World War, when there was there were many, many people that started manifesting uh, traumas and inabilities to speak, to hear, to talk, to remember, as a consequence of uh, psychic traumas. It has been thought, it, it's called shell shock because it was thought to be provoked by the explosion of bombs and grenades, but this was proven to be wrong because um, it, it is not about the explosion of the grenade affecting the brain. It is the trauma that affects the brain and doesn't allow the person that has been traumatized to speak or remember or articulate words anymore. So um, it, the, the word shell shock is today rejected by modern uh, medicine uh, and uh, scientific literature, but it, it has become a historical record uh, to talk about this kind of events. And Epizelos is has been considered the first case of someone going through shell shock because, as we can read here in Herodotus' own words in the translation of Godly, uh, the following marvel happened there. An Athenian, Epizelos, son of Kufagoras, it, it is um, kind of um, the name of Kufagoras is also meaningful because it has registered, it has been registered by prosopography just once, and it literally means the one who speaks about light things, Kufagoras. So there, there might a uh, paratymological connection to uh, speaking and not being able to express what one wants to say, even in the name of Episodus' father. Uh, so Episodus was fighting as a brave man in the battle where he was deprived of his sight, though struck or hit nowhere on his body. So he was untouched. He hadn't been damaged at all, but he lost his sight. And from that time on, he spent the rest of his life in blindness, exactly like we have seen that uh, Croesus' son regained speech forever, here we see Epizelos losing his sight forever after undergoing a trauma. I have heard, this is Herodotus speaking, that he tells the story about his misfortune. He saw opposing him a tall armed man whose bird overshadowed his shield, so a huge, a gigantic man, but the phantom passed him by and killed the man next to him. Now, scientific literature had not been able to determine the role of this phantom, this kind of ghost that appears in front of Epizelos, whether it is a protective, uh, like a hero that protects uh, the enemy, as Cairns has, uh, has observed. So this hero, this gigantic person that appears in front of Epizelos might be on the enemy's side. And so he blinds his enemies and kills and slaughters the enemies so that to make, to give a favor to the opposing army. But it might also signify that this ghost kills those who see him. So we're not sure because Herodotus' uh, tale here is, here is pretty generic. It doesn't give us much detail. So we are not really sure what the role of this ghost in the battle is. What we know for sure is that there is a manifestation of a sort of godly entity. And this godly entity causes a, a valuable soldier, a brave soldier, to lose permanently his ability to see. So it creates this ability either to favor one side or to disadvantage the other. This is not sure, but uh, I think more research, research should be done on this point because uh, Herodotus is really vague, but I think we have some clues from which we can understand what's what's going on here. Now we have uh, another important element to take into account. The fact that disability 
meant instability, especially if you're dealing with sovereigns, so kings and sons of kings. We are here in the story of uh, the descendants of Batos, the first king of uh, the first mythological king of Libya. He was actually uh, an historical figure, but mm, the, the traits that Herodotus attributes to him are kind of mythological, uh, more of a mythological uh, flavor. Uh, and the third descendant from Batos the uh, first genealogy uh, has an infirm, lame and infirm in his feet son, which is called like his grandfather, Batos. So the point is this, uh, th this disability of the king Batos is perceived as a disgrace by the Cyrenaeans. So the inhabitants of Cyrene founded by Batos I. In the view of uh, affliction that had overtaken them, they sent to Delphi to ask what political arrangement would enable them to live best. So we have a disabled king, we need someone else to rule in his place. And this, uh, th this Greek man from Mantinea, Demonax, literally meaning the demos, demu anax, so the leader of populations, the leader of people, is called to take the place of the king. And he decides to basically dispower, to dismember the power of Batos, who was seen as unable to perform his role as a king, and to rather give it, distribute it among the population. So when this man came to Serene and learned everything, he divided the people into three tribes. Furthermore, he set apart certain domains and priesthoods. So he just cuts off some prerogatives from uh, Batos' kingly uh, dues. Uh, and But all the rest, which had belonged to the king, were now to be held by the people in common. Even though this can seem like a sort of democratic distribution, it actually preludes to the dismemberment of the kingly dynasty of Batos I. So the first false step in his dynasty is exactly to be spotted into uh, his third descendant that was disabled. So again, disability is here compared to instability. Another example of this equation can be found in the fifth book, when, where we can see the history of lambda, that literally means the, the Greek letter L, which was shaped like this, like lambda. And this refers to a member of this hierarchy that had uh, the, the habit of internal um, uh, internal rearrangement, familiar rearrangement, so marrying and giving in marriage among themselves. So, uh, like brothers and sisters used to marry, which can explain why there were more malformations and disabilities in this line of uh, descendants of the uh, Bacchiadi. Bacchiadi. Uh, this, so, this one descendant, Labda, had crooked legs. So, she was lame, and that's why she was called Labda, because she was born with crooked legs, basically. And this is also a sign of atrocious future for the dynasty, because she is rejected by her own family, and no one in her family wants to marry her. And the only one that wants to marry her is someone from outside the family, Aetian, son of Echocrates. And Aetian accepts to marry her, but is unable to have children with her. So he contacts the oracle in Delphi, and the oracle tells them so tells uh, tells him that she is in fact pregnant but her son her offspring will be a ruin for her whole uh, population her entire family so the dynasty of the bacchiadi will end because of labda's son so again we can see she's not the queen of this population so the ruin doesn't come from her as a sovereign but it comes from her as the mother of a future sovereign. Actually, Kipselos, which is her son, will be the first of two tyrants that will bring down the whole Bacchiati uh, Genos. So again, we can see a strong link between a disability and a disabled dynasty, a dynasty that will end up badly. I'm sorry, uh, David, I have to ask you to conclude. OK. Thank you. I, I'll around the conclusion, thank, thank you for reminding me. Um, okay, so I just wanted to sum up about uh, this final passage. Um, and the fact is that this oracle that Aetian received had been anticipated by another oracle that described 
um, Labda is an eagle in the rock in, in the rocks. So this eagle is pregnant, and she will be the mother. Will bring forth a lion. So the lion is keep Selos that will actually destroy the dynasty. And what is interesting is that the son is described as strong and fierce differently from the mother, who is a disabled person, but the consequence for everyone is somehow to become disabled. So the knees of many will it lose. So uh, the off offspring of this disabled mother will make the whole dynasty and the whole population disabled. Uh, actually, the knees of man will it lose. It is a formula sentence and it it's not a description of disability itself. Uh, even Homer used to talk about the gunata, so the, the knees that fall down as someone being weak. So it's not just about disability, but it is interesting, according to me, that a disabled mother gives birth to a fierce lion that will cut everyone and make everyone call, fall to the ground. So uh, here's a short bibliography and I thank you all for your attention and sorry if I abused your time.